Good morning. Um, we are still in Matthew. We are in chapter 26. We'll be reading verses um, 36 through 56. That's a lot of uh, numbers ending in six there. Okay, let's pray and we will get reading on this text. Heavenly Father, God, um, please help us as we um, read your word to adjust our own expectations, adjust our own plannings and schemes, and um, submit them to you, submit them to your will and your perfect plans. God, help us to be formed by your word, and please keep us from trying to form your word into our will. Um, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Let's read 26, <clears throat> 36 through 56. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled, that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. God's word to us today in Matthew. All right, take a minute, pause the video if you want to, jot, jot down or type some observations from this text. What do we see here? All right, Jesus took his disciples to Gethsemane to pray. And specifically, he took Peter, James, and John to pray with him. Um, the three men fall asleep while Jesus prays. He wakes them up once, um, but the other times he does not. Jesus... Um, he prays three times for the will of God. Um, Judas comes with a great crowd with swords and clubs. 
And Jesus tells him, friend, do what you came to do. They seize Jesus, a disciple, draws a sword and cuts off the high priest's servant's ear. Jesus tells him to put away the sword, <clears throat> that, he's going, that he is going willingly to fill, fulfill scripture. That if he wanted, he could have his father send angels, but this is to fulfill scripture. Jesus confronts the crowd and tells them that what they are doing is also to fulfill scripture. And then all the disciples leave him and flee. Okay. <clears throat> so, what can we apply from this passage? Uh, certainly, I think we, we should want to not do what the disciples are doing through that, throughout this passage, other than the fact that they are fulfilling Scripture. And we, we all will fulfill Scripture, whether we like it or not. We are, are all part of God's plan. I think that, for me, the theme, the underlying message for me of this passage is that God's plan prevails. And when he says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. We saw at the end of the last part that we read yesterday, how Peter says, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. And then right after that, I mean, it's the same night, Jesus takes them to Gethsemane. And he just says, sit here and watch while I pray. And they all fall asleep. They said, We're, we'll die for you. But they can't stay awake for him. Jesus, he, he tells Peter, he says, so you could not watch with me one hour? For, for Peter, this should be this should be a humbling moment already. You couldn't watch with me one hour. You just said you would die for me. It's kind of, I think is the implication here. You just said you would die for me, but you, you can't stay with me. You can't watch with me one hour. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I think he's saying, you guys made big promises and I know I know your hearts are in the right place, but your flesh is weak. You are going to sin. You are going to fail. The flesh is weak. You are going to find yourself in a position where you show and prove yourself to not be worthy of me. Peter, we'll, we'll read later, proves himself to not be worthy of Christ. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then in this passage where he's praying, he is praying consistently. He is praying, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid, I think in some way. He doesn't say he's afraid, but he does pray, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's not looking for, at the very least we can say, he's not looking forward to this in a happy-go-lucky way. <laughs> I think there are sermons and upon sermons upon sermons that could be preached on this passage, and I certainly don't want to read too much of my own interpretation into Jesus' words, but he clearly prays that if there's a way, please let this cup pass for me. However, not what I will, but as you will. And he prays that three times. He's praying for God's plans to be fulfilled. Plans, plans. This whole passage, I think, is about plans. Judas's plan, the crowd's plan, the, the disciples' plan, God's plan. There's this interesting quote um, that's attributed to Mike Tyson. And he did say something like this, uh, I, I think, but it's, um, everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth, right? 
everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. Or I, I think um, a military version of this might be um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Right? No plan survives first contact with the enemy. Strategy ends when combat begins, right? The disciples, they've got a plan. <laughs> we will never leave you. We'll die before we betray you. This is their plan. And then they get hit in the mouth. Right? First contact with the enemy and their plans are out the window. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Where's their plan now? It's not such a great plan, apparently. Um, similarly, the crowd, they, they have plans. right? One plan, um, he, well, he points out to the crowd, you know, I came every day. I was in the I was in the synagogue in the temple teaching. You didn't seize me then, so your plan is to come and take me here um, in private. They've got plans, and they they think they're enacting their plans, but there's a, a plan here that goes beyond the plans of man. And Jesus prayed that plan. He prayed God's will. God, please let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. God's plan. Um, God's plan will prevail. Our plans are, are weak things. We don't have the foresight. We don't have the wisdom to make plans that are lasting. But God does. God's plan will prevail. And, and it's amazing to me that Christ tells his disciples what you're doing, it's part of God's plan. Right? This scattering, he, he said it in the last, last segment that we read yesterday, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will scatter. This you fleeing is God's plan. And then um, here he says, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He's saying it's God, God's plan that this would happen. I could overturn this. I could not let this happen. But it's God's plan. I will fulfill God's plan. And he's, he already told his disciples, you will fulfill God's plan. It doesn't matter what you say you're going to do. You will do what God has decreed you're going to do. You will flee. The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And ultimately, what you're going to do is fulfill God's plan, his decree. Whatever you say you're going to do, that's very nice. But God's plan will prevail. In fact, there's a, a Robert Browning poem about a mouse. Um, it's like, um, but, mou uh, but mouse, let me think. But mouse friend, um, you're not alone. Oh, sorry, I should. But mouse friend, you're not alone. Uh, proving foresight may be vain. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry um, and leave us only grief and, pa and pain instead of expected joy or something like that. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, leaving us only grief and pain instead of expected joy. Something, something to that effect, right? Um, we lay up all these plans. We think we've got it figured out. And our plans constantly fall apart. Right? We have a plan until we get hit in the mouth. But again, again, God's plan. God's plan does not fail. The times we find ourselves making plans that succeed are the times when we have our plans lining up with God's plans. You think you're a great planner. God is a great planner. If your plans line up with God's plans, then your plans will succeed. 
If they do not, they will fail. And here we see these this sinful crowd, right? He's, he describes them as um, the hands of sinners. He's, he's about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Jesus' plan is working. The crowd's plan, the chief priest's plan is working. Their plan is, is succeeding. What does that mean? It means that their plans are lining up with God's plans. And that's exactly what Jesus says here. He says, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. You guys think, think you've got a really good plan right now? Well, let me tell you something. This plan that you think is yours is actually to fulfill the scriptures. God has decreed that this will happen. That's amazing. It's humbling. God, please let us get our plans in line with your plans. Otherwise, we're, we're just looking forward to a life of despair and disappointment, frustration. But the cool thing is, is if we see our lives as in God's hands and his plan as being totally in control, we can be at peace because we know that the sovereign, loving God is in control of our lives. Jesus is communicating this and he's saying, I'm at peace with what I'm doing. I, I'm going to my death because God has a plan. There is a plan here. And all you people, you're responsible for your actions. He said that in the previous, previous um, passage we read. But this is still God's plan. The times we are living in are part of God's plan. We have responsibility to God, but we are still living in his plan. And we can't thwart his plan. My conclusion for today is this. And it's simply a proverb. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. I believe that is Proverb uh, 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. We need to get our thinking straight on who's in charge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, you are so good. You are so wise and you are in control. We thank you. We thank you for the fact that you are in control. How else could we have hope? And we do hope in you. God, please. Help us to submit to you so that as we make plans, we submit them to you and, and say to you, not my will, but your will. And that we appreciate the fact that everything that comes to pass is because of your decree. God, help us to trust you. Help us to not think you unreasonable because you have a plan but to think you wonderfully merciful because you have a plan. Not to think you cruel because you work that plan out, but to think you steadfast and enduring and gracious to us because you work out your plan and you do not bend to the will of man. We thank you for that. God, um, we pray that you would please humble us. Please change us and change our hearts through your scripture and make us submit to you, God. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Have a great day, everyone.